Well, good morning, everybody. It is 10 a.m. on Thursday morning, and so this is Lancaster Woodturner's Weekly Coffee Hour. My name is John Kelsey. I'll be your moderator today. Um, I'm going to report that our system here seems pretty stable. I'm going to invite those of you who belong to the Lancaster Club to send in your 2022 dues of $30, which you can mail to me at my street address, which you'll find in the club directory, um, or you can PayPal to me at my email. Um, uh, or you can show up here and give it to me in cash, which Lloyd Ziegler just did, where we have about oh, 10 members have renewed out of our 66 current. Um, I don't think there's any other club business or uh, Zoom business or coffee hour notes business that I want to do today. I don't see Kenny Vasco here either, so I was going to raise his question, but I'll wait until he shows. So. Uh, we may have some time for show and tell later in the hour, but I'm going to go first of all to our guest, John Jordan, who's an old friend of mine and an old friend of wood turning and an old friend of the AAW and a, a great artist turner and a tool developer and, and, and a teacher and an educator and, and all around just generally sweet man. Um, John has agreed to give us a slideshow with uh, and to take questions from us this morning. So, John, with that, are you ready to rock and roll? I am. Thank you. That's that's awfully kind of you, John. You know, may, you may see Vicky wandering around in the background here. She, there she is. <laughs> Some of you probably know have met Vicky. If you ever do any business dealings with us, you you probably talk to her rather than me because she'll be sure that it gets done. That's the best uh, as John ever. said, we, we go, John and I go back a long time. I always thought he was one of the best. I tell him he's one of the best looking wood turners there is. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's the haircut, John. <laughs> it is the haircut. Indeed. Yeah. But uh, he, he asked, I've been meaning to join you guys anyway. I get the invitation every week and I have, have meant to, to uh, join you and, you know, Things are busy and there's always something coming up. And so anyway, John invited me this week. And so we, we finally done it. And uh, what I've done is I, 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 I didn't go to a lot of effort for this. It's pretty casual, but I, I dragged a bunch of photos into a folder and I'm just going to show those. I didn't know who the audience would be. Uh, typically when I do a slideshow, I show a lot of slides of, of, uh, well, if somebody said after one of my slideshows one day, hell, that was John's vacation photos. Well, you know, that's usually the kind of slideshow I, I show. I, I like to show the things that interest me. So, you know, you never know what I show. And, you know, things from museums and, and rocks and trees and beaches and buildings and cars and motorcycles and dogs, you know. So I show a lot of stuff, but, to, but I'm going to spare you all that today. And I'm just going to show some of my work and uh, a, a couple of odds and ends, but not too much. And so if you have a question, um, just yell out. And uh, we've got plenty of time, I think, to I can talk about any of the pieces you want. And uh, we, we can be a little bit technical here, I think, in, in our time. So I can talk about wood turnery stuff maybe a little more than well, I get to sometimes. So if you have questions, yell them out. Otherwise, I probably won't elaborate too much on, on different things. So if you want to know about it, uh, speak up. And, I'll and also, you can also get our attention by with Ray's hand, as you know, which is down on the uh, reactions tab in the bottom of your screen. And that pops your little box up to the top of my screen. So I know you have a question, and I'm bullish enough to interrupt and get your, get, help you get your oar in here. Okay. okay. Well, I mean, I, you, you guys have your way of doing it, and I and, and so that's fine. I don't care if people just speak up. Um, uh, since I've started doing the remote demos, uh, have, having, you know, done real live demos for 35 years, the strangest thing about doing the remote demos is, is there is no interaction. So, so I get people when I do the remote demos to to speak up, I say, "Gosh, I need I need some feedback. I've got a an earbud in my ear, and and I can hear you while I'm turning it while I'm working, you know. And I, so I like to hear from people while I'm doing it. So you guys do it like you want. I'm going to see if I can get that screen back again. 
Let's see. And that should be it. How about that? <laughs> Looks like a two-headed cow. So like I said, tip, typically my slideshow is full of this kind of stuff. I, I don't have but a few of these. Uh, but I'm, I'm, a, I'm a sucker for roadside attractions. And well, the thing I miss most about not having done any, any demos and classes this last year is the road trip. I enjoy driving the old highways and, and stopping to see things like this. So, and this is what, this is what I still do for fun. Uh, Vicki and I still ride quite a lot. And, uh, until recently I've been, uh, I've redone old motorcycles. I had a shop full of motorcycles that I redo and mess with and sell and, paint and do all that stuff but i've gotten rid of everything but this so i've sold everything off but we'll just look these the, the slides are not really chronological but they might be sort of chronological so uh back in back in the uh, late 80s and early 90s i did a I did a ton of these these bottle shapes and uh that's honey locust by the way everything you see here uh, every, every single piece of turning is turned from Greenwood. Is that hollow, John? Is I'm that sorry? piece hollow? Is oh, that yes, piece hollow? Yes. yes, it is indeed. And I'll, I'll show you something in just a second. What size yeah. is that piece? How big is I'm it? I'm sorry? How big is that piece? Well, I, 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 I don't remember. That's pro it's probably nine inches or nine or ten inches tall. <laughs> most, <laughs> most of the... Most of the stuff size wise, unless I tell you differently, is you know, in the in the nine, twelve inch range, kind of a normal scale <sighs> stuff. Uh, a few of them are real large, a few of them are smallish, but most of them are kind of kind of a like I said, nine to twelve inch range. Johnny Locust turned in grain using the sapwood for a focal point. Can you move your uh, mouse? off so we don't have oh, that sorry. big fly on your there you go How's thank that? you all right thanks for pointing that out uh osage orange again using uh the, the sapwood as a focal point and a uh, oh. box elder bleach box elder and i did an article for fine woodworking it, it, that missed John's tenure at Klein Word of Working, I think. I don't remember who the editor was. This would have been in 1990, I believe. Uh, but they did a really nice article. It was a lot, I don't know, six or eight pages. This is on my website, by the way, if you're interested in these things. Uh, this article is on the website and tells you how to make these things. Uh, but that was a pretty nice selection of those. And and uh, right, well, you can't really see it well, but right there, if you look at my little mouse pointer, you can see some little circles. Those are bullet holes. <laughs> and that's what let that red fungus in. Usually you see a worm, a little wormhole that's let the fungus in. Well, in this case, it was bullet holes that gave that fungus a way to get into the wood. What caliber did you use to shoot the tree? <laughs> those were, I think those were like 30-30. They were jacketed bullets. They had a, a brass. Uh, I've occasionally been able to keep the bullet in, in the side of the piece. And I, I have some pictures of those, but I don't think they're in this, in this slideshow. But that's a uh, uh, box elder. And they're using that, I, I, I guess if, the way I, th I would look at myself is, and my work is, th is the way that I orient grain uh, to take advantage of the grain patterns and, and colors and stuff like that. I spend so much time, well, not so much time, but thought. I put a lot of thought into that, and I'm very careful to do these things. And uh, somebody the other day, I'd posted, I think it was this piece. Uh, and the guy says, boy, well, it really takes you a lot of uh, experience and, and so forth to do that. And, and I 
And I told him, no, I didn't think it did. It just requires you paying attention. You know, you don't necessarily have to have lots and lots of experience to, to use the, the grain patterns in your orientation to, to your advantage. Uh, there are articles on my website and I, I have a, a nice three hour video if anybody wants to get into it more. But again, they're all turned from green wood. This is a big piece, probably 15 or 16 inches tall. And it has a companion black piece that goes with it. And it belongs to the Mobile Museum of Art. And these pieces, there were about, I think there were 13 other Turners uh, that uh, the museum sponsored this show or, or the, uh, uh, an organization called the United States Information Agency, one of your obscure government programs, uh, sponsored this show that went through Eastern Europe right before the, uh, the Iron Curtain came down. And uh, this show went to all these uh, museums all through Eastern Europe, uh, Lithuania and Latvia and Poland and Czechoslovakia and all these places. And it was just a very cool show going to in these 800 year old museums and stuff, pretty neat. And another piece from that time period. I don't know if I have a detailed shot of this or not, but you can kind of see up on the top through there that, that those same little chips are organized into a pattern on the top. I don't have a picture of that. And that's a uh, bleach box elder. That's probably 11 or 12 inches tall. Is that really? all hand? Is that hand carved? All hand carved, yeah. Well, by well, hand, I, I, I mean, I use all sorts of uh, stuff, but but yeah. And you're carving uh, that while it's on the lathe? No, no, no. They're, they're never carved on the lathe, John. The, the, the vessel is turned, and if you do, if you do carving like this, a uh, heavy carving, uh, since the wood is green, there's a chance it might crack along one of those thinner areas. And so you can do surface textures and stuff while the piece is green, you know, when you're not removing a lot of wood. But if you do deep lines with something like this, then you have to, uh, there's a chance that it would crack. So I, I usually don't do that. John, do you have a, a lot of your projects appear to be without a finish on the outside. Is there a finish that just yeah. didn't? Oh, yeah. Yeah, they did have, it has a, it has a, a, a a light finish on it. It has kind of a moderate sheen. You'll see it better maybe some other picture. Uh, it's it's probably the equivalent of wiping a couple of coats of of like a wipe on poly or something like that. I use a spray finish typically. But rarely rarely shiny though. You don't see a whole lot of gloss stuff from me. I remember the first time I saw that piece or a piece like it. It blew me away. Yeah, well, this was a nice one. If you like pretty wood, that ought to do it. I've gone through periods where if I if I ended up with wood like this, I would throw it away <laughs> or give it away. I always I wanted plain, plain wood without any because I did so many black and white pieces. And any figure in the wood shows in the carving. And it makes it you can make it look like you damaged the carving, you know. So, so how many pieces do you do in a year? Any more, not many. When I, when I was being relatively productive, but, uh, you know, 50, 60 major pieces. Right now, not that many. This is a written, this piece has the, uh, the pith right down the center. And, and, uh, that, that presents some problems sometimes, but, what that does is it gives you this, this pattern that radiates out from the opening all the way around. So it looks like it's dripped down. So maybe like glaze on a, on a pot, so, as opposed to this one, which does not have the pith in the center. So the other side of this piece looks different than this, where <laughs> this piece, you know, has the same appearance all the way around. This is a really big piece. This is, I don't know, 20 inches or so. That was a, you know, 70 pound chunk of wood when it started. 
So do you take it to a finished surface in that first turning and sand it yes, and everything? Yes. Well, I, well, they're they're rarely sanded on the lathe gun, but occasionally. But uh, yeah, but there there is no second turning. They're all there... turn green, start to finish, and that's that's where the the careful orientation comes into effect. Is you you have to, you know, if you if you don't do it. A uh, certain way, then then the then the movement that the piece takes is going to be uh, obvious or objectionable. Uh, I like to minimize the effect of that movement so it's not apparent in most of my pieces. You know, and the carving, then I can incorporate the carving yeah. into that movement, and and uh, so you don't really see it, but you have to be careful in the way it's oriented. This, okay. uh, I made about seven or eight of these pieces. Uh, Vicky, I have one here, uh, or Vicky has one here. And then uh, I'm not sure which one this is, but uh, one, one went to the White House collection of American craft, which is now, now in the Clinton Library in Little Rock. Uh, the curator <laughs> of the Renwick Gallery was retiring and bought one of these. So it's uh, in the Renwick Gallery. And uh, there's one in the, in the Mobile Museum of Art and one in the High Museum, I, no, in, in the Asheville Art Museum. So they did really well. I've got two questions in the room. Uh, uh, that Barry, you go. Could you describe the finished technique that you use here? It's, it's a, a hammered surface that's done with a reciprocating carver. Uh, with a little round point. It's, it's basically just dented, if you will. And then how is the finish? Is that a, like a satin lacquer or? No, it, well, it's, di it's dyed black. And then, yeah, it has some sort of matte lacquer on it or semi-gloss lacquer on it. Yeah. I'm not sure yeah. what I was using on these at the time. This is from early 90s. This is probably 93 or 94. The year of American craft was 1993. So that's when we all, uh, Vicki and I went to the White House. Uh, Ellsworth went, was with us. There were, I don't know, there were 30 craftspeople or so that went to this thing. It was really very cool. And uh, Jeff Carroll, you had, Jeff Carroll, you had a hand up? Yes. Um, when you're turning these green, how thick is the, is the wall thickness on these? Well, the a, a, a good thickness for green turning in general is a quarter inch, five sixteenths. I don't make things ultra. If you make things ultra thin, then you get uh, you can get some bizarre distortions. Uh, there's a mechanical strength to these things by leaving a little thickness uh, by you know from the shape. Now that the ones that have have uh, the deep carving or flutes, they have to be left thicker. So they may be three eighths and in up to as much as half an inch. And the thicker I leave it, then the more caution I have to uh, exercise to be sure that they don't crack. And and by caution, I mean that I stick them in a. Oh, Vicky, Vicky, get me, get me my uh, cord quick. Yeah, it wasn't plugged in right. My. If I go to sleep, I'll be back in a minute. My, I thought I had a full battery, and I don't. So. Uh, Kai, you got a question? It. So you have to leave them. Uh, like I said, I leave them a little thicker, and then I'll put them in in a cabinet and let them dry for a few days that way, so they don't dry too quickly. Uh, um, Kai, bear with me just just a second. Let me get this sucker plugged okay. in. There we go. All right. Okay. Life's good again. Yeah, John, I've got I've got a question. Um, even in in ant grain, I would expect some movement when you fit lids um, to your pieces. Or well, if you um, if you could if you could pieces. hold this, you would see the movement, Dieter. Sorry, it's there. It's just subtle. Mm -hmm. So um, does that piece, for example, have a little overhang in the in the lip that kind of um, hides the the movement in the joint? Well, yeah, piece? okay. Well, okay. That well, you brought up something I might have forgotten. The the lid 
of the piece actually is round. It's, it's rough turned and returned. So the lid itself is actually round on these pieces. The opening, if you looked at it, would be slightly over. Being in grain, this one is oriented in grain, you know, this way. Mm -hmm. So the move, the, there's not a huge movement. Plus, I use woods that are stable. I, I would never do these things in, in woods that are very volatile and move a lot, you know. I wouldn't use red oak, probably, you know, or, or sycamore. <coughs> my um, this would John, be a soft you... maple or box elder. When you talk about green wood, is that really green? Does, well, does, wet, doesn't matter. Or do you kind of um, store it for half a year or a year before you start working on it? Well, there's dry, there's dry wood and everything else. So uh, I prefer it when, it when it's had squirrels in it recently, you know. But uh, the wood will stay green for years if you leave it in the log, you know, which I do. You know, my ideal source of wood is I have the entire log here and I just cut off of it as I, as I work. If you yep. start cutting, if you cut a bunch of blanks out of your log, you probably screwed up. Okay. Because Thank most you. people do that and then it cracks and checks and then they turn it anyway because, because damn it, I, I dragged this home and I cut, went to the trouble cutting it up. I'm going to make something with it. So now you got a piece that's it's full of cracks and, you know, you end up with sort of a shitty piece. So I recommend you don't do that. <laughs> you won't, what you won't see, and, and again, from all the green wood here, is you won't see wood movement unless I intended for you to see it, number one. And number two, you won't see cracks and stuff. You know, there, there are never any cracks in my pieces. Uh, if, if, if I turned a piece and it had a little crack in it, uh, unless there was some way to completely conceal that, uh, I, I would, I just, I, I would reject it. This, uh, is a big piece. This is probably 15 or 16 inches tall. And if I lean my chair back a little bit, I can see it. That's on my mantle in the living room. This, this one belongs to Vicky. Oh, we have a video to show showing my hollowing tool. That's a little piece of a cherry, I think. It's a very short video. Doing a final cut, so I'm just I'm doing a little smoothing inside the lip, and then I'm going through there and making the final smoothing cut. And my left hand is the key to everything. Again, this is not a demonstration, but you can see how I regrip the tool and, and flex my left hand. That's where the movement comes from. Well, that's that. Uh, this would be a bleached box elder and a dyed box elder. Sorry, that, that picture's got a lot of, uh, well, it looks like dust, but I guess they're artifact digital stuff. And as a pair, they those are in the uh, Victoria and Albert Museum in London. Are those both carved the same way on the surface? We can't quite see it on the light one. Yeah, I know. It's hard to photograph. Like I have better pictures, but I don't know where they are. There, you can see a little better. It just has a couple of different textures and you know, this one has some smooth areas. So the, the textures are not identical, no. But I, got two, I got two more raised hands. Let's see what those questions are. Okay. We got, we got uh, Mike Lebo. What you got, Mike? What, what are you using to texture that? Uh, these would have been done with the reciprocating carver, the little hammer, hammered texture. Okay. And uh, the, I think on that black one, I think the finer texture uh, 
is some kind of little chisel point in that reciprocating carver. It's been a long time. Okay. <clears throat> Kai, you got a question? You're muted. You're muted, D Dieter, Kai. Uh... <laughs> um, I've just seen it. Um, John, what, what do you use for bleaching the, the wood? Two-part wood bleach. Just, just look up wood bleach. You can find it. See, mm -hmm. um, I've, okay. I've, you know, un unless you bleaching's not ideal. I, I haven't bleached a piece in a long time. The, the wood's going to win and 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 be its own color, even though you've bleached it. And uh, so most woods end up going back toward a little bit of brown and stuff. Uh, and it's really nasty, nasty stuff. And so unless you got something you really think you need white, I, I don't recommend it. But two-part wood bleach, you can look it up. I use a, a brand called Clean Strip is my favorite. Yeah, right. Thank you. <laughs> sure. The, uh, this is a silver maple burl. Again, if you like pretty wood, that's kind of Nice. I did a series of these spiral pieces for a show at the Lake Del Mono Gallery. I thought they were kind of fun. They probably weren't the best for seed piece that I ever made, but I liked them a lot. And there's Look. a cherry one. Silver maple of some sort. And a similar piece, but a tall one. This this is another large piece uh, that has the pith down the center, so you get those same patterns all around the piece. This one I think is 18, 19 inches tall. A lot. Of, it's a lot of work when you do pieces that scale, or it is for me. You once told me that a piece like that will get taller while it dries. That and it will, in fact, John. When when uh, when you turn that thing, it will it will measurably get taller. That that one, just a while, I guess probably a half inch taller after after it's dried. And does the bottom pooch out, kind of? The bottom will, in fact, pooch out. And if you and if you leave wood there to to allow you to remove that that uh, bottom that protrudes or pooches out, I didn't know anybody knew that term, but me. <laughs> Hillbilly, this part of the country, not many people would say that, but it, but yeah. So if you leave enough wood to, to remove that where it where it's pooched out, then you might end up without a bottom. So you have to kind of do a balancing act in the thickness you leave. But if you leave it pretty thick, then you're virtually guaranteeing a big radial crack. Uh, and so what I do on pieces like this is I drill, I drill a big hole in the bottom to remove the pit. And then I'll put a plug in it after it's dry, and that that re relieves that tension, and you don't get the the radial crack. Uh, there's an article. There's an article on my website. Yeah, I haven't I haven't done any any promotion here, but I do have a website, JohnJordanWoodTurning.com, and there's a lot of articles on there. Uh, all and, I, three, I will, and they cover there there's two or three articles on wood and wood movement and that sort of thing there's a a number of hollowing articles there's resource lists for carving tools and that kind of stuff uh, so i would highly recommend it and also instagram if 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 you uh if you've never checked out instagram it's it's probably the the best place to look at wood turning on the internet uh, way more activity than you'll see on any of the internet forums and stuff like aaw and wow and all those uh, it's not really a place for discussion much you can ask somebody a question or make a comment about their work but but nothing ever comes to the top on instagram so whatever you say just goes goes away but the there there's a whole there's thousands of wood turners that are not part of our uh, AAW network and, you know, with clubs and all that stuff. And a lot of young people 
So somebody said the other day on, on one of the forums, well, we're just a bunch of old guys, blah, blah. And if you look at the pictures of those of us here today, well, that, that's true. But on, on Instagram, there's lots and lots of young people from their early 20s, you know, to middle age uh, doing a lot of exciting work. And they're not part of any of our traditional wood turning groups. Got two Check raised hands. Instagram. It's easy. I got two I raised like hands Facebook. here. Facebook is a wasteland, as far as I can tell. <laughs> but, yeah. uh, Instagram is uh, really not. You know, there's not a lot of crap. And, you, know, you type in wood turning and start following people that do that, and you'll see a lot of amazing stuff. Uh, Doug, you got a question? Yeah, I just was wondering, you mentioned about it getting longer. I'm assuming that's because the diameter has shrunk down slightly then as well? That's, that's true. Okay. How much does this diameter shrink when it goes up by the one half inch that you said? Have you ever measured it? Is it, is it a lot or is it just very small? Yeah. Well, if I had to get it, if that piece grew a half inch taller, it probably shrink a half inch in diameter, Doug. Just a, a wild ass guess. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and obviously, guys, it's not, nothing is growing longer here. The thing, if, as, as the diameter uh, shrinks, it squeezes the ends out. Yeah. So that, that's where the length is coming from. Uh, I had a guy in a, in a workshop one time, or in a, in a, in a, in a slideshow, and, and I thought he was going to go to the car and get his gun and come shoot me. He said, I'm a contractor, and that's not true. He said, all the houses I've ever built, all the walls would be, you know, the ceilings would be lifting off the walls and stuff if what you said was true. <laughs> it was really hard to get it across. But anyway, we better keep moving. Uh, we Ron, you got a question. You got another question well, I just here. wanted to comment on that. Uh, that's just like a natural edge pole. It's going to get narrower, and it's going to get longer. It's going so to become, exactly it's going to look, it. it's going to look more like it did when you finished it. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's going to go slightly more over, Ron. That's exactly right. Yeah. yeah. This, uh, this is a piece of ash. I don't know if I have, this one has a black companion piece. Uh, but you've seen that one before, so I didn't do a great job putting these together. That's a uh, silver maple burl. I did a whole group of these with these little veins. Uh, they were inspired. There, there's a spiral piece. I could have done a better job on these. Uh, red maple burl. That was a really nice tree. I made a little money from that one. And it, uh, some nice pieces. Uh, John, what is the, it appears to have like a, a blue dome on top is that just the background coming through or something no that's that's the background of the photo okay yeah yeah you can see it there that's walnut here i've, I've put a little of uh, 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 a rib around the sapwood and it looks the same on the other side uh cherry I love cherry. And again, playing with the sapwood and, and, and it's no, no accident that, that this little sapwood patch here, you know, showed up there where it did. That's an intentional manipulation of the piece of wood to get that effect. And there's a detail of that walnut piece. More black walnut. These surfaces are wire brushed. It's like a sea urchin. Yeah. These are small pieces. These were uh, for a show that Del Mono Gallery used to use. Uh, used to uh, used to have called uh, small treasures. Works under six inches, and I, I participated most years. And this was. These were the six inch pieces for that show one year. This is probably 15, 20 years ago. That's oak and red maple and through your burl.
Did y'all see my sale come through there? Did that show up? Apparently no. not. <laughs> All right. That's uh, Silver Maple Burl. And the rim, you can't really see it there, but the rim is shaped and has a little texture on it as well. Uh, this is a uh, dyed ash. I like that one a lot. I've never done any more like it. Uh, this is a, a, a tall piece, about 15 or 16 inches. And it has a companion white piece. Yeah, there it is. I wasn't sure if it was here. And, uh, and th these belong to the uh, Asheville Art Museum. Got another question, Doug. The what? Yeah, I, I was just wondering, John, what would you say your percentage of time carving versus turning is? Well, uh, on, on, the, on the, well, when we get to the carve piece, they uh, a lot, probably, you know, if the piece takes two hours to turn, it, it might take, it might take 20 hours to carve it. Yeah, you know, some of them, some of them are extremely labor intensive. Doing surface textures like on these pieces, that's that's not so quite so time consuming. Any of them that have the deep carving and a lot of shaping of the piece, uh, they 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 probably have five to ten times as much time in the carving. These just have that hammered surface. This is dyed silver maple, and those are steel lids. I do a lot of metal lids. So when you have it off the lathe and you're carving it, how do you hold it? What are you using as a workpiece apparatus? Uh, I, hold, I hold it in my uh, in my in my lap a lot. Yeah, I don't use any kind of holding fixture. I don't have any of those those swivel around things. You know, the trouble with those is you have to leave a tenon or something on the bottom. Uh, that presents problems in itself because you'll have wood that's discolored if you leave that tenon. Uh, plus, you can't get it where you where you where you want it. I flip these things around a lot. Uh, maybe I can show you a picture in a minute of my little work workbench. Yeah. You, these you are were, uh, textured ash. You were saying about metal lids. Yeah, these are these are steel. All have steel lids. Do you make those? I do. Yeah. Oh. So that's uh the piece in front is honey locust and the and then that's a bronze casting in the back. I did I don't know how many pieces I did that. I made bronze castings of the original piece and sold them together. These are in the Philadelphia Museum of Art which was pretty cool. Are they actually both the same size? Yeah, yeah, pretty much. I've never measured them, but you know, from all appearances, they, they're pretty close. In the, in the photograph, the bronze one looks significantly smaller, but- Yeah, no, no, it's not, yeah. That's just, it's distance from the lens, but yeah, phys physically they, they appear to the same, to be the same size. Uh, cherry. Gorgeous piece. The what? Gorgeous piece. Thank you. And uh, I left the ugly ones out of the show. <laughs> <laughs> another, another question from Doug. Hey, yeah, John, Doug. just a question about the bronze casting. I'm assuming it was a, a wax mold you put on it, but what did you do? Is it the bronze no. solid or is it cored out? Uh, no, no, it's hollow. It's okay. hollow just like the wood be. So, so you make a wax mold and then put that into plaster well, and then pull. Well, it, it's what they call thin thin shell ceramic. Okay. But the but the foundry does that. I don't. Yeah, sure. I wouldn't. I wouldn't have. I wouldn't have a clue beyond knowing that it's thin shell ceramic. Yeah. Thank you very much. Sure. And that's a detail of that last piece. See the little butterfly there. That was art in itself. <laughs> yeah. Well, that one's kind of fuzzy. Sorry, it's not a very good picture. But that's the top of that piece, which I think makes a great photograph. 
Do you put any finish on the inside? No, never. 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 No. Not necessary. Not needed. Uh, this is not like, you know, traditional woodworking where, you know, you, you finish the underside of a tabletop like you finish the top for wood movement and all that. You, you don't have to worry about those things here. Some pretty silver maple. You can't see it, but the uh, since that was so figured, I didn't want to do texture of the outside, but inside the lip uh, has texture. That's a little uh, maple burrow jar that's been dyed. And there's a detail of that. That's a uh, fossil walrus ivory in the top. A walnut. This was one of the AAW auction pieces one year. That's probably about 10 or 11 inches in diameter. Now that, that you ask about how long it takes, something like this takes a long time. That's a lot of carving. I'm right. That's a copper, a copper lid on a mesquite, on a mesquite jar. And these, these have steel lids. That one has a copper lid. That's rosewood. This is a wood called carob. One of my very favorites, it comes from Southern California. It was a street tree. Uh, I think it's probably an Asian tree. And the wood becomes more pink as it ages rather than fading to brown. Uh, cherry. These, these, these jars are usually end grain pieces. This is a side grain piece. And we don't have time to linger here really, but uh, playing with the sapwood there. So you get the sapwood of the lid and the body to kind of match up is requires a little bit of, of thought and effort. Got a question from Jim Bowman. Yeah. Hey, Jim. Hi. Uh, you leave a lot of sapwood in. How do you avoid getting it checked in the drying process? I I like your sapwood in. I like to do that, but I have a lot of issue with it cracking. Well, I, normally, normally it's not a problem. Again, if you if you turn in if if you start with wood that doesn't have cracks, uh, there's no reason really that you should be getting cracks in it as it dries. If you get cracks while the piece is drying, then then it's drying too fast. So okay. you, you have to slow it down a little bit. Again, okay. most of these things are relatively thin and drying is not a huge issue. Uh, something like this that's a little bit thicker to accommodate the carving. I said I put it into a cabinet for, you know, and for a week or week or 10 days to slow the drying down enough. That's all it takes. And then and then you can take it out. Uh, and that's all that's all you're using you're not putting it in a bag for a month or two no you're it would get all moldy and this in the white sap wood would would be all crappy brown and stuff no you don't you don't want that you don't want that you want to dry it you, you want it to kind of dry as fast as it can without cracking so you got to kind of be right up you know near that line but it's, it's just not a problem again there's some good articles on my website on about you know how how this stuff dries and how I go about it. So you it's, say it's not, cabinet. it's not complicated. You say cabinet. Do you have like a lamp in it or something? No, just the cabinet. Just close the door. Just to slow the airflow down a little bit. You okay. could put a piece into a cardboard box, say. A paper bag is is you know almost more than it is required, but you could put it loosely into a paper bag 
but you don't want to wrap it up in plastic or shavings or anything like that. Yeah. Duxbury. Do what? Yeah. Jim Duxbury has a question. Yes, Jim. Hi, John. Uh, these are, I get attached to my pieces. These are so gorgeous and so unique and you have to pry yourself away from these, don't you, sometimes? Nah. No? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yeah. No, but I, but I, but I understand what you mean, Jim. And yeah, but you know, honestly, the uh, pieces have gone when I wish they had hung around for a little bit. Yeah, they, they yeah. do. They do. You know, I mean, ultimately, no, I don't mind them going. But, but yeah, I, there's times when they've gone before I was really ready. That's right. not much of an issue these days. Right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, one of these teapots was an issue. I made the very first teapot AAW had a uh, a teapot show uh, uh, and uh my wife liked the teapot and i'd written something and in these japanese characters on it that that was personal to us and she thought that she got to keep the teapot and i said no they're going to auction that you know so that created a problem and i so i went i said well don't worry about it i'll just go buy it back i'll buy it at the auction and uh but it went for like four thousand dollars. So I, I'm not. I was not the new owner. No. <laughs> anyway, so I've done a lot of these teapots. That's a graphite finish that that looks, you know, a bit like cast iron. And the hard thing there, and nobody ever notices this, is that little trivet. See how the one corner's lifted up. Nobody ever notices that. <laughs> this is a cher cherry burl teapot. That belongs to uh, our Tennessee State Museum. They bought that from me, which was nice. They've been good supporters of mine. And uh, with steel and bamboo. This is a is a, a big bowl. This is probably, I don't know, 14 inches, 15 inches across. Uh, Mark Gardner and I made this for the, the auction at Penland School. Uh, the, the wood is poplar that's uh, milk painted and textured. And then the bottom is steel. Uh, and that, that steel bowl is hammered out here in my shop on a, on a stump. And some of you probably, or a lot of you have seen those uh, shows on TV where they make motorcycle parts and they use the English wheel to run the steel through. So this has been run through the English wheel. And then a, a, a guy named David Clemens did the, uh, the uh, etching on the steel bowl. And then Mark and I made the rivets and all that stuff. It was pretty cool. Nice piece. This is a uh, copper. This was also made at Penland. That's copper and cork. Uh, the cork is like turning styrofoam. Uh, but if you if you go slowly and, and with a nice sharp tool, you can get a nice clean finish. That's right off the tool. There's no way to sand it or anything. I got two more raised hands. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, that would be Duxbury and Doug again. Duxbury, hey, go first. Hey, no, no I, no, I took mine down. I'm okay. okay. Doug? Be that way. Yeah, and John, do you ever spin anything on your lathe, like the copper or, or anything like that yourself? Or have you done no, all that? No, I, I don't ever spin any. I don't ever spin anything here. I know a little bit about spinning, and I have I have spun some steel, but I don't ever do it here. I always mean to and never do. Indeed. Uh, like I said, most of these things are hammered out. Okay. Yep. Uh, cherry burl. Uh, the trouble with cherry burl is ever finding anything that's clean like this piece without any. They're normally full of bark inclusions, and holes, and cracks and stuff. So this was a really primo piece. Hard to come by. You couldn't, you couldn't buy it. You know, you couldn't set out today to buy a piece of wood like this. There's just nowhere to get it. 
That's a sugar maple burl that's been dyed. And these little bowls, I don't make a lot of bowls. People certainly don't know me for my bowls, but uh, these are smallish pieces, about probably six inches. And uh, these are all in the uh, Smithsonian. They have uh, copper. This one has copper leaf on the inside. And this is copper leaf that's been uh, patinaed. And this one has copper leaf on the outside that's been patinaed. And a couple more little bowls. Sometimes I, when I do demonstrations, I used to demonstrate a lot of bowls and I end up with a cabinet full of these little, little six or eight inch bowls. And so once in a while, I'll take some of them out of the cabinet and, and sand them up and paint them or, or for, to give away or auctions or some stuff like that. Oh. The black jar. A little, uh, probably dyed maple. Jeez. Wow. That's uh, red maple or, or as I tell people, if you, if you paid $50 for the, for the, the blank of this wood from, from one of the wood dealers, then it's ambrosia maple. If you pay $50 for the whole log, then it's just red maple. Differences in the price. The uh, this, this was one the these these stripes, you know, had such a, a, a longitudinal feel to them, or if, if that's the right word, uh, this piece sat around for a long time because I didn't know how to carve it, where the where the carving wasn't going across all of these things. And, one day it occurred to me, I'll make the elements go along with those stripes. It really worked out well, particularly on the side, which you can't see real well here. But this little band goes circles right around. I was really happy with that. More teapots. That's now you that turn, elm burl. You turn that with a disc for the spout uh, around the whole pot and then carve it all away. Is that right? Well, no, I don't, I don't leave a, a, a disc because that would take a larger piece of wood, but uh, just uh, it just protrudes, John. One could leave a disc, certainly, and that would be less likely to swatch your finger, uh, but then you have to have a bigger piece of wood. So little pieces of burrow like this are kind of precious. And, and so, so that was a branch or something coming out of the burrow? Do what? Was that a branch sticking out of the burrow? No, no. No. Okay. I got more raised hands. Okay. Let's see who we got. Uh, go to Alan, gallery. hello. Okay. Uh, up, Alan. Yes. Uh, back up on your uh, teapot there with the uh, the trivet. Uh, or can you tell us about that raised corner? How, how does that happen? You're the first person ever asked that, Alan. <laughs> That's uh. Well, it's turned. It's turned with a little with uh, extra thickness around the edges and, and then the other three are carved away and that one's shaped. Okay. It's, it's, kind of a, it's kind of a long process for a, a seemingly very small thing, but it makes me happy, you know. Keeps me out of the bars. Cool. Question from Ron. Ron, you got a question? Yeah, John, that teapot, that's one piece. I've seen the techniques where they make teapots in, in halves and then they carve out the spout from the inside. Yeah. Is that a question? Is, it, is that one piece, the one you have? Yeah, that's all one piece. Sorry. So, yeah, because I've seen yeah. them where they split them through the spout and, and no. take them apart and hollow them out. No, no, it's all hot. It's turned just like a little, a little lidded piece. Yeah. It just happens to have a spout on it. Okay. And then the spout, the spout is drilled out and carved and all that. You know. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. There's a there's a lot of ways to do it. This little piece was made for uh, one of the pop auctions a few years ago. 
that's a it's smallish it's six inches tall up to the knob there and that has a steel lid here you go here's something fun have you ever seen this So at the at the end, you can if you have really wet wood, you can you can blow out that free water, and and what that what that will do is it'll keep the piece from staining up. Sapwood, uh, like cherry sapwood or walnut sapwood, uh, a lot of you probably turn natural edge bowls, and you have this white sapwood. And the next day you go back and that white sapwood on your walnut bowl is turned gray and brown. Well, that's because you've left the free water in it and the free water supports fungal growth. And that's what stains it up. So if you can blow that free water out of there, then it won't discolor. So on your little natural edge bowl, you just take the air hose and just blow the sapwood. Here I'm blowing it out of the whole piece, but I'll spend when I finish turning this piece, I'll spend 10 minutes blowing that air out. I mean, blowing that water out so it won't stain up. Hey, we got another video. That's enough of that. <laughs> All right. We're about out of time, John. Yeah, we're coming up on the hour. You got any more, any last slides you'd like to show us? We got any last questions in the room? On on the deep on the deep vessels, your 15, 16 inch, are you <laughs> literally hand holding the chisel as you go down in? Say say that again, Jim. On your tall vessels, are you literally freehanding the chisel and reaching down to the 15 inch depth? Uh, yes, yes, typically. Uh, I have on occasion on some of the large pieces, I used uh, Lyle Jameson's D handle thing, but I'm, almost everything I make is, is just free, free handheld. You know? This is a piece I made with Cynthia Gibson. So she did all the pyrography work on it. There's some about, there's a load of tools going to be uh, black, black oxided. And some of my tool handles. And there's a batch. I think those are probably going off to Packard Woodwork. So that's some of my tool making stuff. And this is a, a recent piece. I think we're about done here. So uh, I really like this piece. This is in a museum exhibit that opens uh, next weekend. So, Peace. and that has a that, that steel lid and a steel. And you can see the little ears on the side here are uh, part of the piece. So all that has, this one leaves a band all the way around it that has to be carved away in order to leave these two little ears for the for the steel and there's a similar piece and a little teapot uh probably the last piece i finished here and the detail of that all right i'm going to show you kind of a gross picture here i'm going to tell you a story and then and then <laughs> we'll we'll go uh, i try to put this in in, in all my demos and stuff these days, you, some of you maybe even know this, but my friend Clay Foster and I both two years ago had liver transplant. Clay was, Clay was near death. He was extremely sick uh, and had a transplant. And, and I was not as sick, but I had liver cancer. And uh, 
Uh, I got a transplant two weeks after Clay did. Clay's doing extremely well. Just, he, it just, it's remarkable how healthy he is now and the difference that it's made in his life. And, and, and I just say this to encourage you, if you're not an organ donor, even at, at our ages, you can be an organ donor. The liver I received was from a man that was older than I. And um, so, so just think, think about it. Uh, you know, it's easy to do, tell your family. And, uh, you know, you might save old wood turners like Clay and I, but, you, but, you know, it could impact some uh, younger person's life as well. So it's a big deal to me. So I'm going to show you this last picture. And that's what it looks like when you get one. Thanks. <laughs> All right, we'll get that off there. On that right, note, put me back on the screen there, John, so I can say bye to everybody. And, and the and the share, would you? In the share, stop share. There you thank go. Thank you, John. There we go. Very good. Yep. yep. Guys, thank, thank you, John, for having me. I'll join in one one Thursday here before long, and just to hang out. And we'll be back next Thursday at ten o'clock, and it'll be a show and tell Thursday. We got work in the room, but we're going to let that go by. There was one question that maybe we can quickly answer for Kenny Vasco. How do you finish a rolling pin that you're going to sell people, if any? <laughs> I know I don't ever put finishes on rolling pins. I but probably wouldn't, good. but prob I, I, if I was doing it, I'd probably use like Mahoney's walnut oil. Mm -hmm. Mahoney's That's what walnut. I do. Yeah. Yep. Yep. you can see vasco over here showing up his uh showing off his rolling pin i just bring it up because i know he's got the uh craft shows he's selling at now and he needs to know the answer so there you are mahoney's oil, walnut oil or else no finish i think is the answer and back to gallery view i want to thank you very much john for uh, joining us um i enjoyed that a lot and i'm going to put it out to aw as a separate slideshow it'll be as a you know, so it'll, I'll put a note up on the forum and post it to them okay. as well. Great show. Well, Thank we you so all, much. We can always do a, do a remote demo sometime if anybody's interested. We might very well take you up on that. Check check out my website. Buy I'll, some tools. I'll put the link to your website in the uh, follow-up chat that goes out in a couple of days. You're a good man. Good to see you, John. Good to see oh, you. Thank, thank you, John. You. We, thank need, thank we you. need to talk about when you're coming this way, so give me a call one day. February. I will. Okay, give me a call. I will. Thank you, guys. I'm going to end the share yep. the meeting for all now. Thank you all. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, guys. Very Thank impressive, you. John. Thank you very much.